which is going to be chaired by uh, Professor Lorraine Maserol of the University of Queensland. And uh, one of the moving forces behind the amazing uh, flowering of evidence-based policing as a society, uh, we hope joined up with the society here uh, in Britain in uh, many important ways um, uh, in, in Australia and uh, well known to you from her uh, research on legitimacy. Please welcome Professor Lorraine Maswell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And who was at the hotspots? Well, was it called the hotspots band last night? Larry, it was. Um, who was at the hotspots dance last night? Put up your hands. Okay, so I think this man, gentleman down here that, who's on our panel is going to win the prize for the man with the best move. So it was fun. Thank you very much to, to Larry and his, uh, and his mates for uh, putting on a great show. Okay, so we've got four speakers today. We've got Jonathan Roy, Michael Ball, Bassett Javid, and Bill Jeffson, um, who are all sitting down here. Um, they're going to, they're from Merseyside, Hertfordshire, West Midlands, and also Hertfordshire um, Police Departments. Um, and I think you're going in order, is that right? Yep. Okay, so we'll start with Jonathan Roy, please. Okay, good morning. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be invited to, uh, to speak here on what is a, a partly finished uh, thesis rather than the completed article. Um, and I was rather surprised to be asked to talk to you about the journey and the difficulties we've had in, in getting towards uh, a randomised controlled trial in Merseyside invo involving high-risk uh, and prolific domestic abuse offenders. Um, straight away, you might realise with domestic abuse, there's going to be some challenges. Um, I think for me... Uh, in talking about this uh, journey that we've undergone, I completely underestimated the challenges in getting this RCT off the ground, uh, much less actually writing it up into something like a thesis. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about why we're doing this, the importance behind it, the journey we've undergone, uh, and the learning that's come out in terms of setting up and supporting and developing that evidence base to inform policing as we move through. Okay, why are we doing it? Globally, nationally, you can argue about the statistics, but it pretty much says it all and is very stark. 76% of all domestic abuse incidents are repeat incidents generally. High risk, two women a week and one man every 17 days die at the hands of a current and an ex-partner. About two billion a year in global costs. And locally, we're heavily influenced by the Commissioners, the Police and Crime Commissioners plan, which guides what we do. Domestic abuse is stark and writ large within that plan. We, like many forces, have recently been inspected and hammered um, by Her Majesty's Inspectorate in the Everyone's Business Inspection, uh, and there are clear gaps in what we're doing. Pretty much everything that we've done traditionally has looked at victim-based interventions. The MARAC process, the multi-agency risk assessment conference process, which is the multi-agency pathway for supporting and managing domestic violence and domestic abuse, is entirely victim-focused, certainly within Merseyside. And yet, domestic abuse accounts for 5.3% of all our recorded crime, 19% of all our serious assaults, 30% of injury assaults, almost 60% of harassment, 84,000 incidents in the last year, nearly 5% of every call out, police call out that we attend, and 15,000 domestic violence call outs. The numbers are going up rather than going down. They're stark. The traditional intervention, interventions simply aren't changing the picture locally. When you look at it from a perpetrator um, angle, we had 4,500 crimes in the last year, domestic violence crimes, committed by 3,500 perpetrators. But the top 200 most prolific perpetrators account for 12% of all those crimes and 9% of all the incidents. If you put them to the two groups together, you've got 240 perpetrators in Merseyside who account for a significant chunk of our domestic violence call-outs and domestic violence crimes. 
So we've got a power few cohort. That then gives us the opportunity to develop and deliver interventions, a systematic approach to dealing with that power few, to testing it in what is admittedly a high risk cohort and trying to drive those numbers down and trying to keep victims safer. So there's a need for a new approach and we had a gilt edged opportunity with that power few cohort to deliver something. So we looked at some of the theories uh, and I'm pleased to say attendance on this programme is something that very much opened my eyes to some of the possibilities that were out there and we looked at deterrence theory particularly Kennedy's focused deterrence and the focused deterrence approach, that critical issue of notifying offenders, following through with the effort on an individual basis. So we had an approach, we tried to develop the operation. We then looked for established good practice, learning that was out there, and we found next to nothing. Killingbeck in 1994, Killingbeck is a small, small area of West Yorkshire, uh, ran a similar domestic violence perpetrator programme back in 1994, claimed success and was then forgotten. The only people, people who built on that seemed to be a small city in America, High Point in North Carolina, um, who again developed a focused deterrence approach to domestic violence offenders uh, and were very grateful for Chief Marty Sumner's support in sharing his, uh, his learning uh, and his outcomes. He didn't conduct a randomised control trial um, and he does claim a 6.2% reoffending rate from perpetrators. It's marvellous if that was true. I don't think we can rely on that, hence the reason we've got to conduct the test and the experiment here. So we came up with a plan. There's some broad statements there, um, which in themselves uh, probably don't mean that much. The important thing is the activity that we're going to undertake and we have undertaken. We consulted extensively in developing this plan uh, and we'll talk through some of the learning shortly. We consulted internally with our stakeholders. We consulted with victim advocacy groups. We consulted with academics who support us um, in some of our local work around domestic violence. We consulted with community, community, community safety partnerships, with the criminal justice se sector, with chief officers, with HMIC, with other forces, and it's never been quite enough. People are still coming back in, wanting more consultation, greater involvement from their agency and their sector in the plan that we're conducting. Focused deterrence strategy applying to domestic violence perpetrators is new, it's difficult and it's high risk. We're going to run this with two cohorts in the RCT and it's a three-phased operation. First of all, the offender identification, so we draw up a long list based on repeat call-outs, weighted and ranked with offending history, severity of offending. That then has to be risk assessed down into a short list, which is the cohort that we'll be targeting. The trick around, around the, this is taking the long list and identifying the risk to the victims associated with the perpetrators on that long list to make our assessment on whether we can manage and mitigate that risk. This is a high risk strategy. People are very concerned that when we start to engage and target domestic violence perpetrators, the risk to the victims associated with them will shoot up. The most critical aspect of the plan is trying to assess that risk because there's little or no um, background studies that are out there, there that will help us assess that risk. Assess the risk, mitigate the risk, and be satisfied that we have in place measures that will allow us to, to watch that risk as, it, as we move through the operation. If we can't keep a close eye on it, if we don't have effective oversight and overwatch, we can't include the perpetrator in the target cohort. In that process, we move to a short list of offenders who then move on to Operation High Point and then move into the, the trial itself. They're then randomly allocated, or they will be randomly allocated in the RCT onto either the control group or the treatment group cohorts of 60 at a time into each group 
moving forward over a six-month intervention plan. So those who are allocated the treatment group are first of all notified, they're given a domestic abuse warning notice, um, a criminality notice. It puts them on notice that this, this is a new day, things are being done differently in Merseyside Police in terms of managing domestic violence. We're not going to simply sit back and wait for a complaint of assault or harassment from the victim. We're not relying on the victim support for this. We're moving forward and we're focusing on that individual. Once notified, they move into a holding pattern. We don't do anything with them. We sit back and watch. We only react and put into place the targeted intervention plan once there is a further repeat, a repeat call out, repeat intelligence, uh, a further um, offence, domestic violence offence that is linked to that individual. <coughs> once that happens, we then, they're then subjected to a seven day targeted intervention. Um, proactive policing, minimum of daily contacts, uh, a bespoke targeting plan is developed, and it's developed once they're accepted onto the cohort, which is then engaged and they receive seven days of focused and intensive policing. At the end of that seven days, they're brought back in, re-engaged, and given a further uh, warning notice. And that pathway continues for six months, at which point an assessment is made of their offending, whether they remain on the cohort or move off it. When you do the sums, we're going to need at least 240 to detect the difference on the cohort. 120 in the treatment group, 120 in the, uh, in the control group. We simply don't have the capacity to run that, to run 120 and deliver the focus at any one time, so it's staged. Blocks of 60 starting in the new year. I've written on there that it's a test of nerves. There's a huge amount of potential risk with this. Notifying an offender that we're focusing on them because of the domestic violence, issues of coercion, control, further offending committed against the, the victim, victim that we can't and won't pick up on, and take some nerves to push this one forward. And that's why we're now on our third go at this. The first attempt failed completely, Poor planning on my part, I think, largely. Uh, I completely underestimated the impact uh, of an operation like this, the willingness of people to do it, and the concerns over the risk. So we then went to a dry run, which was supposed to be uh, testing, well, I did test elements of the plan rather than the plan as a whole, uh, in three geographic areas within Merseyside Police. 28 perpetrators uh, pushed onto it. We found two that were removed during the pilot due to increased victim risk. Victims rang us and said, for God's sake, stop. It's making it worse. And they were removed from the pilot. Only one case of known reoffending, which was a breach of restraining order uh, in the remaining intimate relationship cohort. So you'd think that would show some promise. The problem we had, though, is in every single case, the victims disengaged with the domestic violence advocate who was supporting them at the start of the process. We're now in the process of recontacting and re-establishing relationships with those victims to establish whether um, the reoffending, the offending pattern changed for the better, or whether there were significant issues of control and coercion. But the reality is, we don't know at this stage. There was some positive innovation when we ran it. We learned some lessons and it showed some promise. But there were real issues with officer engagement. Detectives, uh, and in your organisation, your police department, it might be different, but the culture we faced, that specialist domestic violence detectives didn't think that proactive interventions was their job, wasn't their responsibility. Neighbourhood officers who had to deliver the proactive focused policing were scared. Domestic violence, we don't, we don't do domestic violence offenders. What about the risk? These are the same people who all day long will front up high risk gun crime nominals and gang members, violent offenders, burglars, they will do this day in, day out and they really did not want to go anywhere near domestic abusers. Capacity was an issue. We've loaded the risk assessment process on this um, because we've got to. Uh, and it's hard work. 
and people are complaining that they haven't got the time or the ability to do it. Of course, they're losing sight of the fact that if this does work, it will actually build capacity. With some issues with ownership, the biggest question I've asked and the biggest question I've faced from partners and stakeholders particularly is who owns the risk? Um, the only way we've had to move this forward is to accept that we, Merseyside Police, own the risk. And it's been made quite clear to me as well that I personally own the risk. Um, <coughs> of course, if it works, I dare say that, that I won't own anything at all. Um, but there you go. Uh, good job I've been promoted before this started. It wasn't part of the plan. Um, we've had selection bias when we risk assess. Our, do the risk assessment, risk assess the, um, the risk to the victims. Um, we have got selection bias uh, issues that we've got to get over. Um, there's a clear need for a real tight corporate process because people are scared, scared of some of this. They don't want to deliver the notifications because we're making assumptions. And then if that happens, of course, uh, we can't conduct the plan. We're not testing the same thing in each location. Uh, and in previous iterations, we've had too much wiggle room. We needed broader command engagement and consistency in our targeting plans. So we've got some critical bits, really. Standardised our risk assessment and our overwatch. Uh, DMM is our daily management meeting. It's a standard format in, in most of your organisations, I dare say, but certainly in Merseyside Police for managing threat, harm and risk on a daily basis. We now have a scripted mandatory uh, notification, a domestic abuse warning notice. Local panels to support the routing and the risk assessment from within the, the MARAC groups, the multi-agency risk assessment conference groups. Um, integrated offender management uh, has bought into this. We now have the ability to uh, rapidly deliver our intervention. So, so, so when we notify of a breach, practice what we preach in terms of deterrence theory, um, we'll deliver rapidity uh, of interventions within 24 hours. The dosage has been standardised. We've built some capability uh, and we've got some buy-in, um, as long as we accept the risk, of course. But as long as we do accept that risk, we're now starting to find that partners are buying in, chief officers are buying in, and we're actually finally moved into our phase one test, which started with the first tranche of notifications a week ago. So finally, I hope, um, by the new year, we'll be in a position to conduct a proper experiment and randomise um, our perpetrators onto the treatment groups or onto the control groups. But we're not there yet, of course. I think that the big caveat with this is really that we've got a long way to go with these interventions. And whilst people have accepted, to a certain degree, um, the risk, and we've been clear about the risk, we've had real concerns um, around victim, the unknown risk to victims, the control and coercion issues, uh, and perfectly legitimate concerns. But my chief constable, and I'm grateful for his support, and the chief officer group have accepted that perhaps there's a greater risk of us doing nothing we're dealing with around six domestic homicides each year in Merseyside. Um, largely people who wouldn't have been predicted as the highest risk um, individuals. So big questions, and I know certainly um, Professor Sherman has, has talked extensively in the past on I think, Sarah Thornton's uh, work in try, trying to make sense of that risk assessment model. So we're accepting, really, we're moving forward on a premise that the risk of doing nothing probably exceeds um, the risk of trying to do something differently. But I'm under no doubt that we will never move to an experiment on this if our phase one test shows that um, the risk to the victims is significantly increased. If we seem to have increased our offending, if we, God forbid, have a domestic homicide with one of our cohorts, <clears throat> a member of our, involving a member of our cohorts, the plug will be rapidly pulled on this. Um, so there's a long way for us to go yet. Uh, it's taken us about 18 months to move from the concept phase to actually delivering the phase one test through some operational learning, but a bucket full of stakeholder management, um, agreement and engagement. Uh, 
but we're finally there. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed, um, I'm touching wood uh, that this moves forward for the benefit, not of me, but of the victims of domestic abuse, and that we can hope for, hopefully develop something which makes a difference. Either way, there will be learning from this. So whether we, we learn and it's positive or negative, we should be able to contribute somehow to that, that national uh, and international, indeed, evidence basis uh, in respect of perpetrator management, for good or ill, I'm hoping for good. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that um, with the time that we've got for these sessions, do people want to come in further up the back? Or are you like happy to hide up there? <laughs> There's lots of room down here. Oh, Jonathan, come back here for you. Yeah, it's yep. um, so, so come down if you want, all the way down the front. <laughs> Um, so we do we do have a couple of moments for um, for questions of Jonathan. There's one at the back there. Morning, John. Um, Hi. Andre, um, an interesting scientist. Uh, just interested about the interventions and who's doing those for you. Uh, <coughs> Okay, the, the interventions themselves um, will be run by the, the neighbourhood teams, so we're pushing that down onto the, the neighbourhood teams. The tactical plan, so each offender, when they're accepted onto the cohort, before we actually do anything, we develop a plan, so we're looking for the opportunities um, around their criminality, and I think the, uh, the initial work we did around the cohorts, 70-something um, percent of our, our, our offenders who flag up, up in terms of repeat call-outs um, have other areas of criminality, so they've got other levers to pull um, effectively. Uh, so the tactical plans developed, um, which look at those opportunities to, ta um, to t target um, on the criminality. Um, aside from that, there will be mandatory daily visits to the home address. Um, and uh, what we've had to write into this is that uh, at first instance, if the qualifying criterion are met, um, we will apply for a non-custodial domestic violence protection order. Well, we'll issue a domestic violence protection notice and then apply for the order. Um, so there's a fairly, there's some standard interventions, but some of it's bespoke to the individual as well. Um, deliver it for seven days, bring them back in and give them a further warning and then take the foot off. So we're trying to manage that balance of rights. Uh, the plan has got to be developed. Each, each um, me uh, member of the cohort has a plan manager who is a, a domestic violence specialist investigator. So they own the plan. The Proactive targeting is delivered by the neighbourhood teams, okay, so locally owned. Part of the difficulty we've had with that at the minute, our neighbourhood teams in Merseyside don't do anything with domestic abuse uh, perpetrators. They often, neighbourhood inspectors often don't sit on the Marax. Uh, and whilst they might be notified of the high risk um, domestic abuse nominals in their, in their area, we don't do anything with them at the minute, so this is entirely new for them as it is for us as an organisation. <clears throat> um, just repeat the question. Yeah, sorry, the, uh, just asking about the, the third party um, engagement uh, with the, the offenders. Um, we have now got some support in the, the phase one test from the, um, the community safety partnerships have bought into it uh, and we'll manage things as a subset of, of MARAC really. So we get some uh, support and engagement uh, in that way. What we have got real difficulties with in Merseyside is supportive interventions for domestic abuse perpetrators. It, it's a real bit of a postcode lottery in truth. Um, so it's largely police-led at this uh, stage. And that has been one of the criticisms, really, that um, it's a bit much stick. It's a lot of stick and not much carrot. Um, I suppose the carrot is that there's, not, there's no stick at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chairman? Comment and a question. The <clears throat> comment is that um, the occurrence of death in phase one medical trials is expected. That's why they do phase one. Uh, one just happened uh, in Britain. Um, we had a phase one trial of 15 patients in the US uh, a few years back in which seven people died. <clears throat> and so I think it's a really important result. And I wouldn't consider this at all a failure if you get a phase one bad result doing it one way, which then allows you to try another way, which then leads to my question. Have you considered getting victim consent with full explanations prior to random assignment? Um, yeah, we've, we've, we're not asking the victims for consent, uh, but we are speaking to the victims in each case. So 
One of the, the criterion is that each victim um, has to have a, an independent domestic violence advocate linked to them. So an IDVA is, is our standard um, national um, way, way of supporting victims and victim advocacy. Um, so we will engage the victims in the first uh, instance. Whilst we're not looking for consent, uh, what we have said is if there are significant issues and concerns raised by that victim, we won't proceed with them. Um, at this phase, so that's written into it, and it'll be uh, it'll be recorded. Obviously, and we're going to record everything because we are concerned about the risk. Which... Hi, John. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, as you know, um, I commented on this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really good to see the presentation actually, because um, um, my initial concerns was risk. However, um, I also said when I commented on it that I think it's a really fantastic idea for certain perpetrators. <coughs> Um, so my question is, the comment was, I'm pleased to see it, and I, I, I think that um, it's a great idea for, for perpetrators. The question is, in terms of risk assessment, um, one thing I said is, rather than just focusing on the level of risk, mm. focusing on the characteristics of the offender as yeah. well, particularly around that power control, and some of the risk factors on the merit risk assessment, in terms of the background of the types of domestic yeah. abuse, because you're prolific, Offenders who've got an extensive criminal backgrounds, so and this is really going to work for them. The ones where they haven't necessarily got that, but they've got the other controls and threats and stalking, they're the ones that I would worry about. So, are you looking at the, you know, in terms of the lead, <coughs> It's part of it. We, when, when we presented to the chief officers, we actually, um, our own chief officer group, your, your particular. Um, feedback on the plan was included, so they had sight of that and developing it. Um, we will take take notice of that, but what I've not done is excluded, necessarily excluded all those offenders, or those offending characteristics from it, but we, we've got to manage it within the risk assessment. The reason I did that is, or well, the reason we didn't um, exclude all those characteristics is because we felt that, that the target, the population, would be too small then. Um, so, uh, but... The, the phase one test is much more limited and much more tightly controlled because of those concerns around risk. So we've listened to it, we've built it in in part, although we've not excluded all those people from it. They'll be the minority anyway because the majority fall into the other category. Yeah. Um, and also taking on what you said about the victims, if they, if they have particular concerns, because they'll be the best indicator of whether they, if they're scared about this, that generally yeah. means it's <clears throat> Yeah, and, and that just and the, the other point around the you know which you mentioned we're now revisiting the victims in in the first dry run as well to see whether those whether we can pick up on those issues of control and coercion. Okay, so. Good, I, I think, I'm glad that I saw it's good. Thank you. So one more quick question and then we'll have to go to the next speaker. Um, it seems that your engagement with your officers is a bit of a critical success factor, and you said you've had trouble with it. So how are you trying to, to engage them better, and how successful have you been? Yeah, I always seem to have trouble with my officers. Um, <laughs> Perhaps it's a management failing or a leadership failing. Uh, the, there's a variety of ways. I think the first thing is we've accepted that, that we can't just tell our, our cops to do this with um, domestic abuse perpetrators um, and expect them to just crack on. We, we've got to accept that they are nervous about it. So two things we've got to do, a bit of training and education with them around the plan, um, addressing their concerns uh, and trying to get over that. And then the second thing really is, re is assuring them that they've got, got some top cover on this. If they do what we're asking them to do, if they record it, if they behave professionally and appropriately, and something then goes wrong because of the plan, then that's with me, not with them. So I'm giving them some top cover. Um, we're only moving into the, the, I mean, that learning came really from the dry run. We're only just moving into the phase one test. They seem okay with it so far, um, but the proof of the pudding and all that. Uh, so uh, once we have a breach, and I'm sure we will have a breach because I don't really believe that Marty Sumner's 6% reoffending rate in North Carolina, although maybe I'm just cynical. Um, once we have a breach, we'll see, and we've, there's a lot of governance on it, and there'll be a close eye kept on, on whether the officers are delivering those, those interventions uh, as effectively and, and rapidly uh, as they should. Um, to be honest, I'm less concerned about that. I think now they get it, they'll be all right. Um, and in the neighbourhoods they're doing, I think they'll be fine. Um, I'm more concerned about some of the command teams, whether they're going to push it. But we'll see. Okay. Okay. That's fantastic. So can we okay. just thank you? Thank you for
very much, Jonathan. And um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Ball. So if you can do a, your changeover of your PowerPoints. That's right. <laughs> That's the plan. Okay, uh, good morning, folks. Um, I'm Assistant Chief Constable Mick Ball of Hertfordshire Constabulary. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, this morning. And um, interestingly, listening to Jonathan's presentation, the similarities with some of the difficulties and some of the issues he's faced um, <coughs> will probably touch on in my presentation, which is totally a different subject from domestic abuse. So my presentation today describes a new application of electronic monitoring and how it is being used to enable offenders to desist from crime. Over the past three years, Hertfordshire, uh, Hertfordshire Constabulary, together with Hearts Probation Trust, has tried a project which electronically monitors offenders who have volunteered to be tagged as part of a wider, integrated offender management programme. So this project, Tracking Offenders to Reduce Offending in Hertfordshire, or Operation Torch to be short, has tracked over 200 offenders since its conception. However, despite significant investment, there has been no formal evaluation or indeed proof that the tactic is successful in reducing crime. There was a compelling need, with ever-increasing financial pressures, to formally assess this project and to add to the increasing database of what works in policing. In summary, a target, targeted literature review revealed that despite electronic monitoring being in place since the early 1980s, there is little evidence that it reduces reoffending. The focus of the research to date has been on standalone programs of punishment or control, rather than its potential as a rehabilitative tool or its use in tandem with other offender management programs. Overall, there appears an absence of randomised control trials to measure its effectiveness. However, Mark Renzemina um, helpfully suggested these five empirical questions that should be considered when undertaking research into electronic monitoring. I'll just leave those up there for a second so you can take those in. So my aim was to write a protocol for a randomised controlled trial in order to answer the question whether or not this type of electronic monitoring was successful in reducing reoffending. There are three strands to my work. To really inform what an RCT should look like, it was imperative to look at any existing data within Hertfordshire which would then itself inform a pilot test, which again would lead to a wider RCT later down the line. The real issue with the pilot test was not to give the answer to whether this form of electronic monitoring reduces reoffending. It was actually to test the experimental design and to really identify real cause for concerns before we implemented a wider RCT. But looking at the existing data, 93 cases which uh, ran between January 2012 through to March 2013. Unsurprisingly, these 93 cases were overwhelmingly male and relatively young in age. There are high, these are high-end offenders involved in vehicle crime, house burglary and drug supply. Some of these offenders 
are at the right, at the right top end of chaotic behaviour and really hard to reach individuals. Breaking the uh, age of the subject down, I think we can see there the similarity between the ages of the subjects on this cohort and linking that to the uh, widely accepted age crime curve. There is a distinct similarity. What was a surprise was the high number of offenders who either removed the tags from the, themselves and dropped off the programme or were removed themselves by the offender managers, usually because of reoffending and arrest, within the first two months of being fitted with the tag. But what was also surprising was the other extreme, where certainly in one case, an individual was reluctant to remove the tag after a year through the fear of returning to his offending behaviour. As mentioned, some subjects committed crime whilst wearing the tag. Some committed offences after the tag was removed. But significantly, in this cohort, a third of subjects were not found to have committed any offences at all during the follow-up period. This slide gives more detail about reoffending and a first look at survival rates following the removal of the tag. For me, it reinforced the evidence that a small number of offenders can be responsible for a high number of offences. Although, again, I'd like to say, at least 32 offenders in this cohort were not found to have reoffended. This slide is really shown to illustrate some of the difficulties, practical difficulties, with uh, offenders um, and the, the need to flex resources at times of high demand and also at times of low demand. So really looking forward to the experimental pilot and looking at the wider RCT, there's a real crucial need to understand the resourcing implications as we move forward. So moving on to the pilot test and using the data, the next step was really to design a model that would work. Quite simply, the construction of two groups for comparison, an experimental group where offenders were fitted with a tag immediately and monitored, the second group or the control group where the fitting of the tag, of the tag was actually delayed. The whole idea really was to test in real time and at the front end if this design would work. So having undertaken an analysis of the existing data and reflecting on the experiment um, and looking at the implementation of the pilot test, uh, here are my key findings. Firstly, a very clear and unambiguous eligibility criteria is required for any future RCT. In the case of the Hertfordshire pilot test, the varying pathways onto the scheme from purely voluntary and self-referral through to some individuals probably seeing an opportunity to bolster their case for a further court hearing needs to be addressed. As discussed earlier, any future RCT will need to be flexible with the resources in order to meet both high and low demand. The learning from the short pilot test emphasises the need to think through and agree the randomisation process prior to implementation. In the Hertfordshire pilot test, the offender managers insisted on the use of an override facility based on risk, and we heard some of the difficulties that Jonathan spoke about earlier. They believe this was essential uh, for certain individuals um, and they needed to get them on a tag straight away, even if they were randomised into the control group. This, of course, threw into um, the integrity of the whole randomised uh, question, the whole integrity of the randomisation process, and meant that certain individuals were then deleted from the programme 
from the analysis point of view because of selection bias. The examination of the data in the original cohort identified a need for standard and universal unit of measurement which included national systems such as the police national computer to calculate reoffending rather than relying on local databases. And this is absolutely crucial because if you're focusing your experiment on a particular cohort of offenders, they don't understand the boundaries of individual police forces. They will commit crimes wherever and whenever. It's important to capture all the data about reoffending. So when working uh, and conducting experiments where there are shared goals and objectives between agencies, in this case, the wider criminal justice system and the probation trust, it's imperative to negotiate with strategic leads well before any planned implementation. Partnership working is key to success. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the buy-in of those offender managers and their team leaders who are expected to run the experiment is absolutely crucial. Personal briefings and allowing room for discussion before any trial commences is absolutely imperative. This will secure and maintain momentum for your experiment. I'm particularly pleased to have in the audience today uh, Detective Sergeant Steve Burke and Offender Manager Dave Cronin. Dave and Steve were absolutely instrumental in making sure this was a, a successful pilot test. And I do thank them for the work and the phone calls throughout the night to make sure that this experiment stayed on track. Their dedication was absolutely fantastic. Finally, I've provided here on this slide my thoughts on the outcomes of any future randomised control trial. After considering Mark Renzema's five points, I've included the capture of other positive outcomes beyond recidivism. In conclusion, like most things in life, I advocate this tactic will be right for some at the right point in their lives when they, can, they are considering stopping offending. However, but for others, it, it may have little impact. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. That's um, uh, very appreciated. So, do we have any questions? Uh, Harry? Uh, comment and question. Uh, the comment is that if the probation people or somebody wants to override it, um, what, what has been done in the Turning Point Project in Birmingham, for example, is to have that happen before random assignment. So that they still retain their override, but it doesn't hurt the experiments, causal inference, internal validity. Um, but the question is the uh, 28 days um, limitation for the outcomes created by having the control group get it after 28 days. Uh, severely limits statistical power, but what it also does then, if that's going to be the research question, which is just what effect we would have in the first 28 days, um, it seems to me we need something that you didn't present, which is what is the base rate of repeat offending in the first 28 days for these kind of folks when they come out of prison without the tag. So we have, we have really great data on those who had the tag, but to have the without the tag as the context, um, in a way that can almost be a, a kind of level four quasi experiment with a result if you can compare it to the base rate without the tags and see if it's lower in, in the 100 cases you're in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, the 28 days was um, time restricted around making sure that we could see the results of the uh, actual pilot test. The wider randomised control trial I'd be advocating would be need to be much longer than 28 days. Three months, six months was the actual uh, kind of period that I was looking at for a wider trial. But to get the snapshot, if you like, of um, you know, how this operationally works, and that was the real focus of the pilot test, not to actually look 
at the re-offending rates, it was actually to tease out some of the operational difficulties, uh, which we, we certainly sort of heard already this morning from Jonathan, and certainly in my, uh, in my pilot test we could see, to ha help lay down the pathway for the, for the wider RCT. So certainly, yes, the RCT which would be much longer than the 28 days. Thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, one more question at the back then. Just to say, uh, where's the department for a bit of a vested interest? Um, 14 of your uh, offenders committed, or sorry, 13 of your offenders committed 14 offences, tagged offenders. What was your message to control and intervene early on tagged offenders committing crime? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question because uh, with this, it's, um, and the focus being on reducing crime, it was very important to use the data for wider investigation. So the slide I showed right at the start, was a, which is a real-time uh, map of an offender committing a house burglary, moving on from the house burglary to then being arrested in a field that you saw. That was where you actually turn on the other side of the ability of the tag to use it as an investigative tool. Now, from an evidential point of view, we wouldn't use that solely in evidence. But what it allowed us to do, and a good example of that was where a distraction burglar uh, committed a horrendous offence uh, and stole the life savings of an 84-year-old, we were able to track that offender into a CCTV area, covered, covered area, and, and witness them with their clothing and with their description and then using and going into a bank to use that money. We could actually use that surrounding evidence and we weren't therefore needed to use this as prime facie evidence in itself right. So definitely, and part of the offender managers, and it might be worth you speaking <coughs> with Steve and, and Dave later, will very, very clearly uh, identify that offences are happening and put uh, proactive and tactical resources in place to make that arrest. We were not in a position where we were going to be letting people run and continue to commit offences. That wasn't part of the game plan. But... Of course, where people were doing that, we needed to get there quickly and arrest them. And as you can see, that was part of the failure rate, if you like, when we looked at the time on tag. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, okay. Martin. <laughs> okay, so our third speaker is Basit Javid. If I pronounced that correctly. Basit. Basit. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, folks. Bas Javid, West Midlands Police. Um, absolute privilege and pleasure to be here to talk to you today about the subject of my thesis. Um, I've been asked by Professor Sherman. I was always kind of hoping that if I was asked to present to such a learned audience, it would be after I graduate, not before, which is another 10 days. So. It's still time for it all to go wrong, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so the title of my thesis was about improving public confidence in policing, um, and it's based on a test of a local engagement programme that was conducted in West Midlands. I call it a test because you'll see in a moment, um, in terms of the design and how it was ran, um, it's not you know, an experiment in the true sense, so it's been described in the um, literature as a quasi-experiment. So the research question I had was, can local police engagement tactics improve a community's confidence in policing? And the work that I did was um, an evaluation um, study, the academic piece, around a test that West Midlands Police had already designed and were just about to start running at that time. And pretty much it ran throughout the, the course of 2013, um, finishing in December. Um, so in, in terms of what my objectives were, were to try and understand the impact of local engagement on confidence, to more generally explore the drivers of um, engagement um, and public confidence, to, as I said, evaluate the effects of running a test within two neighbourhoods in West Midlands and comparing it against two control areas who didn't receive the same treatment, um, and then formulating some recommendations based on um, confidence in policing. Now, there are various reasons why I chose to do this, aside from the fact that confidence is obviously a, quite a hot topic in terms of um, uh, policing generally. 
But also, the question is, the fact that we measure this, is do we measure it because um, it's important, or is it important in many ways because we measure it? Um, and there are very, very different ways across the country when you look at the different tax and um, ways in which police forces measure confidence, everything from focus groups to surveys, telephone, in, in, uh, people doing it in person. It varies across the board, but the fact of the matter is that we spend tens of millions of pounds across the UK, and actually even in just England and Wales, um, measuring confidence um, and, uh, and surveying the public about how confident they are. And then what actually happens to the outcome of these results as well is something that's very little actually debated. Media does play an important part, and I know I'm focusing on local engagement, but just to give a, a little flavour of something that this was just going back to March this year, where the Home Secretary, who's responsible for policing in the UK, um, described as profoundly disturbing um, the report that undercover police officers tried to influence the family of the murdered black teenager, Stephen Lawrence. She said that policing stood damaged by the findings. Um, also, the, that there was legal action taken by um, several women who said they were deceived into intimate relationships by undercover officers, and all of these things form the opinion, uh, even at a local level, of people's confidence in the police. Uh, we've now got a police officer in jail because of what was described as a plebgate row. Pleb is actually a word I didn't realise until after all this um, stuff on the news, but it is actually a real word. Um, means common, common people. So uh, we've actually got someone in jail now following that um, row in Downing Street. Um, and also the various issues and the alleged cover-ups around Hillsborough as well. So West Midlands, there's a map of the area. Um, it's covered by 10 local policing units, um, all with their own independent command structure. Um, and the, the tests that we ran were on Dudley local policing unit um, in South Birmingham, uh, where there were the two control areas. And the test areas were in Sandwell, the area I was in at the time when this happened. And funnily enough, in Birmingham East, where I am now. So it seems to be that wherever my work goes, I follow. Um, I'll give a basic outline of the test, um, and then I'll go into some of these aspects in more detail, just to give you an overview of, of what, what the actual treatment was. So Mosaic um, uh, consumer information was used to target a community by consulting with them more specifically in their preferred um, way of engagement to try and understand what issues affected them the most. Police officers and PCSOs from those neighbourhood teams then engaged with those people doing a very short and brief survey to try and identify what priorities they wanted the local police to focus on. Then the local policing team implemented um, a problem solving plan to try and address the issues that were identified as being the ones that affect that community the most. And then the results from that work were fed back um, through various social media and public engagement to say what the outcomes of that problem solving plan was. So you had the sort of 360 and the label we gave it was you said, we did, we listened, in that sort of sense that we go back to the community and tell them what we did. And then to measure whether or not there was an improvement in confidence, we used the normal survey methods that West Midlands Police employ, which I'll go on to again in, most, in more detail in a moment, and then compared that between the two groups. So the, rate, the way we selected the areas, the four wards, um, first of all, they were wards that were coterminous in terms of their geographical boundary with the local authority. They were selected supposedly um, on their um, low levels of confidence at the start of the test, the buy-in from the local <coughs> command team, the fact that each of the neighbourhood teams had a dedicated sergeant, and there were supposed to be, uh, but my findings show otherwise, that there were supposed to be similarities in the demographics of the four areas as well, um, based mainly on gender, age and ethnicity. And then the assignment of test or control was not random, um, and if you take the combined results of both test and combined results of both um, control, then it's a level three, um, hence the quasar experiment um, before and after um, results. So the general surveys we do in West Midlands Police, because um, I appreciate in every other area they will be quite different, is we, we do them because we, we have an ambition to improve trust and confidence in policing. Um, and the survey that we do is called Feeling the Difference. It's um, a biannual survey, so every six months we do 8,400 surveys across, across the 28 parliamentary constituencies of West Mids. Um, there are 61 questions, so it is actually a very wide 15-minute survey for those people who do take part in it. 
Um, but out of those 61 questions, it's only one question, which, which I will show you the detail of in a moment, but that's one question that gives the, um, the, uh, the, 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 inf the detail for working out the level of confidence. Um, so this is a super brief timeline of the test that we ran. So in March 2013, we completed 300 surveys across those four areas. Um, to try and see what the level of confidence was at both at baseline, stage one and stage two. Um, and then, um, obviously, throughout the year, um, we did, uh, again, a stage one and a stage two with varying amounts of surveys. The reason that there were 600 in the middle one in stage one is because that's when the biannual Feeling the Different survey ran, so we just boosted the, the surveys as opposed to just sticking with the 300 to try and get a better perspective. But... It, you know, in, it, to try and get the right outcome, I actually, in my test, in my, my evaluation of it, looked at the results between baseline and stage two, so they were comparable um, data. Now, normal engagement in every area is, again, very different, and it's something that's very um, tricky um, to measure. But what we normally do is engage through forums, through beat surgery consultation, through monitoring um, antisocial behaviour and crime data, the list is there, I'm not going to go through the lot, but these are the things that we would normally do. The difference in this uh, test was that the Mosaic Public Sector Information gives that neighbourhood policing team um, various information about the consumer types and the preferred communication methods, the, the style um, of um, various sort of habits of that local community, um, giving a much richer picture in terms of their socio-economic and demographic, I'm sorry, cultural behaviour. Um, the neighbourhood sergeant used that data and information to select the engagement tactics that they would use with those teams. And then the, the surveys that they filled out, the very short forms that were discussed earlier, um, were sent to the organisational service development inspector who picked the top priorities that um, the community said affected them the most. Um, and then, like I said, the delivery plans were developed and then feedback to the community. Here's a very brief overview of what some of the mosaic data tells you. Um, appreciate it's a bit of a busy slide, but essentially this is looking at the South Yardley area, which was um, one of the test areas, um, and you can see that what it shows you is um, is the cursor on there? Yeah. Uh, nearly 70% there of that population fell into those three, three types, um, and using that information, the neighbourhood sergeant would then um, engage with that community um, through the data being captured in these forms and which essentially talk about what the issues are affecting that um, member of the public um, and their preferred methods of communication and this, this is very quick quick time type survey as opposed to the feeling the difference ones where we actually use as a measure. That was then taken that data and um, it was broken down into the three priorities so there again is another example of one of the priorities set. So in this neighbourhood um, the focus for the next period for the next two or three months of that team would be around drug dealing, speeding vehicles, and antisocial behaviour. Obviously, that varied from one ward to another and from one phase to another. Um, and then the feedback I talked about on the website. So here's an example of um, the Birmingham East website for South Yardley. Um, and the, the live feed, lifetime feeds through Twitter um, and Facebook and the website were pushed out to the community so they actually understood what the cops were doing and the way they were addressing the issues that were identified. Um, Is stuck. There we go. Right, so the feeling the different survey measures um, the level of confidence in, in a Likert scale, um, and that's how it was coded for the purpose of the test. Um, this could have been done in various ways, but pretty much we stuck to this way because this is the way that the feeling the difference survey had done it for some time. But essentially, you've got the people who agree from five to seven were classed as being confident. And then the neithers, right down to completely disagree, not confident, with the don't knows being excluded. There are limitations to the survey. Um, obviously, the population um, is residents. So if you don't reside in the area, you don't get surveyed. Um, it excludes the transient population, business locations, and homeless, um, and people visiting the area. Obviously, if you're not home between the time surveyed, which was 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, you're not going to be um, asked what your view is. Um, and also, I think there's an issue in the fact that it's a 15-minute survey. If someone knocked on my door and asked me to talk for 15 minutes, I don't think I would be interested, to be honest. It's, it's quite a long time. 
Um, so the sample size uh, at each one, and I, I did say earlier, I'd look, I'm going to mainly look at baseline in stage two. So over, over the four areas, it's not a huge sample size. So you're looking at 300-ish, um, both baseline and stage two, for all four areas. And if you compare that to the population sizes, um, and then you do a, a calculation of the confidence intervals, um, or, or the sample size needed, should I say, if you wanted to achieve a confidence interval of just one, I'm sorry, 3% plus or minus at the 95% confidence level, you'd have to survey, as an example, Briley Hill, um, 974, so nearly 1,000 people, but we were doing, if you remember, in the range of about 75. So that obviously um, gives a massive um, you know, confidence limits in terms of um, the uh, actual results, which was nowhere near what was needed. And a lot of that, if I'm honest with you, is that balance between operational policing and research and costs and all the other factors that play into this. But nevertheless, um, I don't think it was a good number. And there are other ways we could have addressed that on reflection. And I'll pick up on some of those later. Um, the response rates, I put what my examiner for my thesis, who I think might even be in this room, I won't mention his name, um, said that the response rate was shameful and not fully transparent. Now, my friend David Abraham from um, uh, Trinidad and Tobago would say, no problem. He said, that won't be a problem. But actually it is. 26% um, was the response rate. So, it, you know, out of 1,170 doors knocked, only, um, you know, 26% of those 300 um, actually um, were able to be surveyed, uh, which is, introduces a huge amount of bias into the results. Um, also, the, trying to measure the level of engagement activity that I talked about, that's very difficult as well, because how do you actually measure it other than the number of the forms that we filled in in terms of that consultation? Um, and even then, it wasn't very high, so we had 231 total in Tipton Green, these are the two test areas, um, and South Yardley 176, which are actually very, very low numbers when you look at the population size. It's like a drop in the ocean, and again, I think there could have been better and more innovative ways of, of doing that. Now this um, uh, chart, the, the, the main thing I want to draw your attention to is on the right hand side. The, the reason I did this was to show that actually the, the, how wide those confidence limits were. So if you look at the baseline and test results for, um, sorry, the baseline in stage two for the test area, you know, it went from baseline 75% of the pop, the, the, those surveys said they were confident, 76. But if you look at the overlap there, you'd have to increase by a minimum of 13% just in that test, joint test areas, to even say that there was a difference. So that in itself shows the massive impact that the low levels of um, uh, surveys had. Now, my findings, quite simply, I've said about the sample sizes, the response rates were very poor, leading to a huge bias um, in the outcomes. Um, the application of the treatment was generally weak and inconsistent amongst the areas. Um, you can obviously see I didn't hold back um, <laughs> in telling them what I thought, but. Um, the demographics were hugely different. Those of you who know West Midlands area would know that places like, you know, uh, Dudley, Briley Hill and Dudley and, and um, South Yardley are completely different areas in terms of the age makeup, the ethnicity, um, and even if you look at it on the index of multiple deprivation in terms of deprivation levels. Um, so the demographic was only slightly comparable, um, and it, like I said, engagement's difficult to, um, to, to measure as well. Now, these are two other areas that I thought I'd share with you from feedback in terms of the, the um, from the examiners. And, and the top one, I think, is the most important one um, and something that Professor Sherman and I discussed only, I think, yesterday. And that is that actually one of the things that I've learned the most in this is that if you're going to do a test of this nature, even if it is just level three, you have to make sure that planning phase um, and trying to understand that actually whatever you get at the, at, at the, um, the as an outcome, is it even valuable? Does it offer any value at all to make an assessment um, in terms of um, uh, the, the outcomes? And so my conclusions were um, quite specific to the um, saying that um, it did not lead quite clearly to improve confidence, that the findings were weaknesses in confidence and how it's measured. And incidentally, that's across the board. I didn't come across a single, single surveying method of public confidence in, in all of the forces I looked at when I was doing the lit review bit, where I would actually say it was you know a really thorough, robust method. They all have a huge level of bias. 
Um, the lack of assurance due to, to the sample size and response rates, the demographic uh, matches again, um, and just more generally weaknesses. And this was again one of the comments was the, that from the host of the you know these issues there, from them the detail carefully within the dissertation, but the conclusion would be that the engagement program actually did not even evaluate, wasn't even able to evaluate the the, the results. So in terms of future considerations. Just to finish off, um, I think the basic question is still there. Why and how do police organisations uh, measure confidence? Um, I mentioned earlier that West Midlands are now moving to as keeping, keeping the BMG link we've got for feeling the difference, but we're going to a more of a, um, a qual qualitative way um, of trying to understand confidence through focus groups. Um, so we can actually ask people what confidence means as well. You know, if I ask this audience today, um, are you confident and tell me what confident means in terms of your local police. Ten people will probably have ten different responses to what makes them confident in the first place. Um, so focus groups is one way ahead and then also I think the kind of test that we did would have worked better with shorter surveys with more specific questions just around confidence not the main confidence survey that we do, um, the feeling the difference one, um, and making it just two or three minutes and I think it would have improved, improved the response rate um, uh, BMG, the company who do this for West Midlands, um, do use a what they call a random locational quota sampling method, uh, which again I think has there's some criticism of it, which which I've shared. Um, it's based on the quota of age, gender, and ethnicity, um, which means that it's, it's biased in the sense that we target a particular community and we turn others away. Um, but obviously there are some benefits to trying to get the right um, census match as well. So that was um, the future considerations. So um, there you have it. Thank you. Thank you. So if I um, can take uh, just a couple of moments just to um, uh, make a couple of observations here. I think it's very brave for, for starters to come up and talk about all the difficulties of the, um, of the study. So I think that's really uh, great that you were able to go through all of those issues because I think it is very attractive for police to um, to think about these community-wide interventions and how you would evaluate them and they're very very challenging um, you know it, the end of communities that you can randomly allocate the the range of different interventions that are going into the um, into those communities and the issue of getting this this enough cases from the sample to be able to generate valid and reliable estimates of, of any sort of change. I think all of those things you've really identified um, and then you've clearly identified the issue of you know how you can come down to a smaller unit of analysis as a geographic unit of analysis if you're going to be thinking about any sort of area of studies. So um, I think that there's um, uh, you know there's a lot that a lot of police want to look at those kind of community-wide um, uh, studies, but they really do pose a lot of methodological challenges. So, um, questions from the floor for Baz? Yes, and then yes. It's my twin brother, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot more relevant than you think it is. The College of Policing are carrying on review and neighbourhood policing, and undoubtedly they'll be looking at engagement and confidence. I think they need to be signposted to the work that you've done mm -hmm. because the findings themselves, I think, are quite informative. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, there is an element of problem solving in your presentation. You know, you engage and identify a problem. Do you feel that the skills for problem solve were a factor in in the outcome? No, I don't actually. Um, uh, most of our neighbourhood teams are well equipped <coughs> to do their day to day job, and problem solving is their day to day job. But one thing that we don't do very well traditionally is if the community say, for example, the um, drug dealing is a problem in my neighbourhood, uh, we don't go back and tell them what we've done. So it's more about engagement and communication um, after the problem solving. Um, and quite often, actually, to be fair to the people that are involved in this, the problems they undertook, they actually did do a good job at addressing them. And they tried their best to tell the people what they'd done. Um, but you know that that, that was the, the main the main thing and on, on your first point about the college of policing's work around confidence i mean it's actually worthy of note that the the last government it, it, their last the last remaining police target for 
uh, the Labour government in 2010 was public confidence and the uh, Office of National Statistics do the, um, are responsible for the Crime Survey of England and Wales and that, that's the national measure for confidence uh, as opposed to what individual forces do. Um, but then Theresa May, as the Home Secretary, scrapped even that in 2010. But virtually every force still does it. So, you know, that's maybe the first question for the college to ask, isn't it? Why? Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, Joe. Um, really interesting that we're now rolling this out as an idea for forward mm -hmm. uh, The criticisms that you've leveled and the information really hasn't been listened to, so we're still driving to do so much work about confidence. One of the questions I wonder is why, why we keep this to satisfaction? So, confidence sorry, say that last again. Satisfaction yeah. service. Confidence is an ethereal concept an individual has. Mm -hmm. Satisfaction is about the service we deliver, and I just wondered if that ever came out in any of the conversations we're looking at. What we are, what's the purpose of what we're doing? That almost the first question: Do we look at satisfaction versus confidence? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll hit the first bit first because it is an interesting point that West Midlands Police is still doing a version of this and being rolled out across the force. And I think that probably goes back to the original point. I was absolutely brutally honest in terms of the findings of this. But I think what the examiner said at the end is actually we weren't really able to evaluate it because of the, the data. It just wasn't there. But actually, there is a lot of literature and findings from other people like you know Betsy Stanko and others to say that if you engage with communities in the right way, then that improves confidence in itself. So there is plenty of other findings out there. And I think the, the changes that we've made to the rollout um, as a result of this um, and doing the focus groups alongside that, I think shows a level of promise in terms of trying to do things differently. Um, satisfaction, trust, confidence are all words that quite often are interlinked. But in terms of satisfaction, certainly the way West Mids do it is it's satisfaction, we call it contact counts. It's more about the actual contact with victims of crime or victims of ASB. So that's more about the service delivery to someone who has been victimised in one way or another. And again, the way that we survey those people is, I, I describe it as woeful, if I'm honest, it, and, and it's very, very different to this, these types of surveys as well. But the, a lot of work to be done, um, and I actually do have a plan uh, with ACC Fuchs, who's responsible for that now, to talk that through, so hopefully make some progress on it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ben. So our last speaker today is um, Bill Jessen from uh, Hertfordshire Police. I was just sitting reflecting on Baz asking, how confident are you? And I wasn't until he, he took down his own presentation because much more shameful than the respondents' rates to the survey that we've just had about is my ability to drive a computer. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and I'm here to speak about my randomised trial or a protocol for a randomised trial comparing the effectiveness of two kinds of community resolution for youths in Hertfordshire. I'm just going to take a canter through some of what I believe is the relevant national landscape, then move on to the protocol itself, and then finish. I just want to touch on ethics, because the ethics question when I was putting the protocol together uh, certainly focused my mind. So the national landscape, this is, for me, the so what question. Why is this important? Because, of course, we should focus our effort in places where it matters. In recent years, there's been a national rollout of any number of different programmes under the banner of restorative justice or community resolutions. And whilst there is a strong evidence base in relation to restorative justice conferencing having a positive effect, that is a far cry from many of the programmes that have been implemented in the UK. Quick, cheap resolutions do not carry the same evidence base. In 2012, the Criminal Justice Joint Inspection 
report lamented that restorative justice had been rolled out across the UK in an inconsistent, unregulated and untested manner, leading to a postcode lottery for some offenders. So in effect, for me, there is a need to know what works. And that can be established through the creation of an evidence base. So that's the first point. The second point is net widening. Now, net widening has been subject to discussion, but no clear consensus. In short, has quick resolutions mixed with police performance actually led to more people coming into the criminal justice system in the widest sense? More police records, more intelligence records on more individuals. I won't give away the identity of this handsome young man, <laughs> but he does take after his dad. <laughs> and after years of watching him play football, he, I can assure you, needs the net to be wider because, <laughs> because Ronaldo, he is most certainly not. But this question is about our kids what could possibly be more important? So have we widened the net? This shows a trend line of the number of 10 to 13 year olds who were given their first disposal by Hertfordshire police going back over time. And you'll see there's a rise from about late 2009, quite a distinct rise, but I've marked it in any event. Late 2009 is when Hertfordshire Police rolled out their version of restorative justice for youths. Have we widened the net? I don't know. Because this was rolled out, not as a trial, not as a test, it was rolled out because it was thought to be a good thing to do. And to look back now and ask if we've widened the net, we'd be simply guessing, because the mechanisms weren't in place to test. So that's the second point. Third point as to why is because of the potential for an increase in demand at a time when police are reducing resource. We've already heard about the age crime curve uh, this morning. And some of the widely accepted conclusions in criminology relate to the age of onset, the prevalence and onset of def desistance in relation to offending. And this is one, one of the charts to show the example. In short, teenagers are the most prevalent and they commit the most offences. Not rocket science, testing. But the key to this is when you consider the number of births in the UK. And if we just look at the number of births in the UK going back over time, what we'll see is that from about 1990 through to 2001, there was a decline in the levels of births. But since 2001, there's been a steady rise and we're experiencing a baby boom at the moment. I'm not a mathematician, but if you take 2001 and then add 13, you get to about 2014. <laughs> so, what, so what we can say is that from about now, for the next decade, we will have rising numbers of teenagers. And if the age crime curve holds true for this cohort, then that will be more demand on police. So that's the third reason why this was important, in my view. Just moving to the protocol then, the protocol was looking to test the hypothesis that a more formalised process in relation to non-criminal justice outcomes 
would reduce the prevalence and frequency of reoffending. And th these are the main uh, aspects of the, the protocol that was uh, devised. And I'll, I'll speed through some bits and, and maybe focus on one or two other bits that, that uh, sort of focus my mind for longer. So first of all, the, the treatments then. Informal resolution, uh, dealt with on the street. Uh, there's no contract, no assessment of needs, no treatment, processed by our generic frontline staff, and there's no involvement with any parents or guardians. This is about youths. The more formalised resolution, there's a contract agreed and signed by the offender. A multi-agency assessment <coughs> of the potential causes for underlying for the commission of crime, treatment for any of those unidentified issues. The process would be conducted by specially trained staff within our children and young persons teams, and there's direct involvement with parents or guardians. So both these disposals already exist in Hertfordshire, but we're just looking to see if, if there's a difference in outcome. Is the additional investment in the more formal resolution worth it? <coughs> Eligibility criteria, uh, first-time offenders, only interested in first-time offenders, under the age of 18, who admit to a gravity factor one or two offence. That's in line with ACPO guidelines, uh, use, using the ACPO definition. Uh, but in essence, that's the low end of the scale, shopliftings, criminal damage, and, and the like. And of course, committed in Hertfordshire. Specific exclusions, again in line with uh, ACPO guidelines in relation to this, and there, I, I shan't go through them all, but some of the offences that are specifically excluded from this trial. So I, I, th I think it was Mike that said, Mike that said about the, the, the need for the eligibility. We, we've been quite clear in this protocol. Just looking at the, the pipeline and random assignment process, so we're looking uh, for an offender to be identified for an offence that scored one or two. Uh, if that is a yes, then they move to the next stage. Does the offender meet the eligibility criteria, i.e. under the age of 18, no, no previous convictions? If yes, move to the next stage. Do they admit the offence? If yes, do they consent to allocation to either? If yes, then there's a telephone call put into what we call our crime service team, which is an administrative unit that looks after the, the administration around crime reporting. And there's a QA process there to check that it's eligible, uh, that the offender is eligible and the offence can be included. And if the answer to that final question is yes, then you're randomised uh, uh, to either the formal or informal stage. And you'll see all the noise. You can exit at any stage down that pipeline. So that, that was the pipeline uh, process that we settled on. The timing, uh, daily referrals, these things happen on the street. Shoplifting was the main offence uh, when we looked at the numbers. So it's daily referrals. That brought a limitation to us because our crime service team only work from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. They're not a 24-hour uh, team. So we looked at whether to expand that. Uh, and on reflection chose not to. The hours of restriction we thought would have minimal impact, minimal reduction in our sample, so we tolerated that potential risk. Just looking at the, how we measured and managed the treatments to make sure they were carried out, with the informal process fairly straightforward for us, paper submission to the crime service team to say the officer had dealt with it on the street, uh, uh, and that's, that was the end of it. In relation to the formal resolution, we use a case management system initiated through that paper submission again to the Crime Service Team, and then we would track the nature of the contract, if one was agreed, did they comply with the contract, yes or no, what was the outcome of the needs assessment, what support was offered, was that accepted or rejected, if accepted, was it completed, yes or no, all questions that come out from research of, of previous programmes, and then the cost. Uh, in relation to the informal resolution, there's no need to capture it. It takes about an hour. 
for the formal resolutions, we wanted to capture the cost of all the, the different stages so we could do cost-benefit analysis at, at the end. In terms of measuring and monitoring the outcomes, I'll perhaps take this bot bottom-up. What we're looking to seek to capture is the prevalence, nature and frequency of reoffending, measured at six monthly intervals for two years. Looking at only police recorded data, uh, some work will look at self-reporting, that might throw in different, different results, but what I was interested in was the reality on the ground. We don't solve every crime, uh, so I wanted to know what the reality was on, on the ground. Sources of information, uh, everybody on the, uh, everybody that had gone through the, the pipeline and was randomly assigned would be entered onto what we call our HOTS database in Hertfordshire, the, the offender tracking system. Essentially, it's a system that tracks offenders, captures intelligence automatically, and populates every day. So we, we'd be able, fairly sure we're capturing intelligence arrests, any subsequent convictions on that system. As a safeguard, we would lock that, that, that system's open to all, but as a safeguard, because if cops anything, they'll break it. Uh, <laughs> what we didn't want was unfair targeting of people on the pilot, so we'll blind uh, the, the hot system just locked out to an administrator. But of course, the hot only gives us offences and intelligence within Hertfordshire, so we'd then use Police National Computer to capture any subsequent uh, convictions. But of course, that only captures some of police activity. Community resolutions don't go on PNC, for example. So as a fail-safe, we'd look to use uh, PNC transaction inquiries, do checks on the name effectively. And if a force had done a name check, we then go to the force and ask them the reason for that check. And we, we felt that using these mechanisms was the best way to capture the best possible information and intelligence on, on the offenders moving forward. In terms of the analysis plan, uh, statistical uh, calculations worked out for how, how to establish any difference in prevalence and frequency. And then this took us into the whole area of sample sizes and the power to detect an effect. Uh, and if you're given one area, you're losing another. So that those, those tensions. Th this is how I went about that. Hertfordshire is broken down into 10 districts. You'll see them across the top. But the children and young person teams, we only have five, which cover two districts. So rather than having one team that had two different ways of dealing with an individual, depending on which district they came from, our starting point was really to look at uh, double districts. If you look at Decorum, which is the first green one right in the middle there, that actually provided the biggest sample for us uh, based on the previous year's data, 133, so that looks good on, in itself. But then when you pair it with its neighbour of St Albans, it's only joint top with Stevenage and North Harts, which is the pink one at the other side. We've already heard today about the difficulty of officers engaging. So one of the things we looked at is what's the total officer count that we'd be dealing with in those double districts. So you'll see the, the, the total officers there for the, for the first grouping is 135. And then if you go back to the quorum, that, that district with the highest volume on its own, it's 152 officers. And the more officers we have, the more likelihood people won't engage the randomization process which is problems that I believe were experienced in Canberra. I know there's uh, survey work in Sacramento. And then we've even heard from uh, John this morning about officer engagement. So trying to keep the numbers down so that to a manageable level, we factored that in. We looked at the districts that share a border with an, another force. If we can keep them in, in force and the intelligence in force, we've got a better grip. So we looked at how many borders do the do the districts have with other forces, and then group that. And where, where we settled on was, was, was looking towards Stevenage and North Hearts. The, 
The power curve here just, just shows the ability to detect an effect, the, the sample that's required. And if you, you see there, if we use Stevenage alone, for example, it's got a power to detect an effect of 0 0.7, which is a medium effect. And then we start to build up to see how many districts do we need, using the previous chart working together, how many do we need to detect a small effect. And for this one, uh, we get to a small effect using just the two districts. When we carried out the same analysis for the frequency, there was a weakness there for us. We required far, far higher numbers. So we had three options to increase the power of the test, extend the duration of the trial. We could go from one year to two years, so increase our sample that way. Fairly straightforward. The four structures are in place. We can see for the next three years, but because we need two years to capture the reoffending, can we see the force structure in five years? Much more difficult. Uh, so I, I steered away from that. Increase the, ge the geographical areas. So we'll go wider, four districts, six districts. That brings problems of increased diversity in the sample, which can lead to anomalies. And then the more staff to manage, which I was concerned about. And then finally, reduce the probability from 95% to 90% confidence. In the end, we, we ruled out decision one uh, just, just because of the, the timescales. I'm confident what Hartfish will look like in three years. I'm not confident what it will look like in five. The other two options there weren't in, the, in their own right or on their own, weren't, weren't big enough to, to give us that capture of a small effect. So where we landed was, was a combination of two and three. I'm conscious of time, but I just want to touch on the, the ethics side of things, which, as I said at the start, keep, certainly focused my mind and, and made me think around this. Because, of course, criminal justice is there to uphold the law, and crucial to the legitimacy of the system is fairness and equality for all. And the trial brings about a difference in treatment based on chance. So I think it's right to question, is that the right thing to do? And then on top of that, we have an experiment with children, which is an added layer for us, or an added hurdle to get over. And I think when, we, when you talk about the greater good and the need to understand and the, the, the gap in our knowledge around this, the greater good argument would win. The second point around the ethics was over independent oversight. If you look at that trial, the police have control of the design, the implementation, the outcomes, with no oversight at all. Independent oversight of out-of-custody disposals has been on the national agenda, and most forces are now setting up, if not already, independent scrutiny panels. On reflection, I decided that there did need to be independent oversight of this protocol, and therefore it was amended to cover that. This I saw as a safeguard to trust and confidence, because we can and we should do all the experience that's needed in policing, all well-intentioned, all to improve our service, but there is a danger if we assume public support for our efforts. Independent scrutiny and debate can help bring the public with us, building more trust and confidence in our ability to plan for, understand, and respond effectively and efficiently to new demands on policing. Thank you. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, I think we've just got time for one question and then we're going to break uh, for morning tea. Any questions? You've got one question. I actually have a challenge to the whole audience and a statement to make about our chair and the panelists, uh, which is that we have seen a magnificent demonstration of the challenge you face in designing police-led experiments. And because that is the theme of this conference, 
and because we're all thinking about these issues so well because of these outstanding presentations. I want to set you up for the afternoon session in which we are going to have a panel of distinguished experimenters who've been down these roads uh, for decades, many times, time and time again. And we're going to have a workshop in which we are hoping you will give us the kernel of a research question and a research design that you'd like to propose and then throw it to the panel on uh, what are the issues and what are the recommendations for how you might go ahead and doing that. Because I'm hoping that somewhere in this audience, in fact many places, there will be people who are thinking of doing their own experiments and maybe thinking after what they heard they don't want to do it now. <laughs> but I hope not. And what I hope is that this conference can add value to your own thinking about what you might do uh, in, in a lot of uh, different topic areas. So, so be, please be ready to give us uh, your suggestions so that the panel can have some raw material to work with. Uh, and I think it'll be a much more productive afternoon session. Maybe you can talk about them over coffee. But before you go to coffee, please let's thank this great panel. Have a